as with almost any week, we come together spiritually and virtually from many different places. We come in joy, we come in grief, we come in wonder, we come in fear, we come in love, and we come in hope. There is room for us all, there is love, and there is hope for us all. This week, most of us find our fear, our grief, our worry, our love, and our hope centered around Ukraine. So as our feelings, experiences, wonders, and needs are expressed and engaged in worship, let us begin with the one that most of us share. Let us pray for Ukraine, for the people. Let us pray for peace, real peace. Let us pray for aggression to end. Let us pray for those who have died and will die. For those who are grieving and will grieve. Let us pray for those who will be in battle, that their leaders may find a better way. Let us pray for the resolve of allies to stand together and make peace the best option. As we listen to the Jubilee Quartet sing Daniel Rubinoff's De Pachem Domine, let us see the beauty of Ukraine and let us pray for peace in our time, peace in their time, peace now.
So how about a little good news? Well, spring is coming. Doors are opening and pretty soon we're going to start seeing each other. Friends, old and new. That's good news. From my personal perspective, I received handwritten birthday cards this week and virtual cards that were unbelievable. <laughs> what an age I live in to get both. I mean, that's good news. Oh, and I was sent a picture of me from the first wedding that I ever officiated. Oh my, good news is that I don't look like that anymore. <laughs> and here's one more bit of good news. This is Kalisto and I have good news. My parents and I have moved to a new house in Port Elgin. The most exciting news is that my parents have finally opened their store. Every time that we gather, virtually or in person, we commit ourselves to being a safe place. A safe place for you, for your loved ones, for your children or your parents, for your hopes, for your hurts. It is our intent to be community with you, to love you as you are. We are not all the same, and yet we not only acknowledge that, but we celebrate the fact that we don't all vote the same way or have the same ways of speaking about God or Jesus but we are always learning how to love each other, even when we disagree, even when we have been wrong or been wronged. We always take a moment to acknowledge the land upon which most of us live, work, worship, and play, land often divided by maps and buried under pavement. The land upon which Jubilee United Church sits was home, comfort, and faith to the first peoples, including the Patoon, the Wendat, the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee, Mississaugas of the New Credit, and many others. The place that we call Toronto was a diverse and dynamic community long before any settlers arrived. And we acknowledge this not only to pay historic tribute to the people who were here then and are here now, but to remind ourselves that these roads upon which we commute were once paths made by animals seeking water. And those paths became trails for people on portage, and then streets, and now developments. There is history, wisdom, and spirit below our feet. We acknowledge that European settlers came with an intent to colonize and not cooperate. And to that end, indigenous peoples have been under attack and denied the rights, freedoms, and supports that we owe one another. We commit ourselves to living on this land with respect and love for the people and the wisdom that have been here for so long. In the month of February, Black History Month, we acknowledge that Canada is not just a country of indigenous peoples and settlers. Many of African descent were brought here as slaves, came here not of their own free will. Yes, we have been a final destination on the Underground Railway, but many black folk were stolen from their homes and families and brought here as unpaid labor. Today, many black folk cannot trace their family trees through places like Ancestry.com because in the past, parents and children were separated and sold as chattel, deemed less valuable, less human than white citizens. Slavery was abolished and great strides have been made, but systemic racism is real, and black Canadians live a very different life than others. Expected to fit into standards that do not respect their humanity, criticized for being too black or not black enough, told to go back where you came from, even when they've lived in Canada for generations. As we desire to celebrate black history in Canada, we must also lament the past, acknowledge the present, and commit ourselves to honoring black history in Canada and the many ways that those of African descent have shaped our country and our culture. A month is a very short time, a few minutes on a Sunday even shorter. But let this be an invitation to not only recognize the wonderful diversity of God's creation, but also the diversity and power of God's love as we experience it in each other. 
Speaking of love, we are an affirming community, which means that we are a safe and welcoming place for all those who express their identity in the LGBTQ2S plus communities. That's lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, two-spirited, and more. I use he, his pronouns, but our community will always include those who are non-binary, identify with other pronouns, and help to broaden our understanding of gender, identity, and God. We are all created in God's image, meant and empowered to reveal, receive, and share love. And so, here we are, together, but not the same. Acknowledging Black History Month, but also aware that we are many races, many perspectives, many experiences. Many paths have led us to be together in this moment, in this place. However you come to be here, welcome. We are all God's children together. Jubilee United Church is returning to in-person worship and activities this week. We will have an Ash Wednesday service on Wednesday, March 2nd at 11 a.m. This service will be in-person and also live-streamed. The service will be a short service, no more than 30 minutes in length, and will involve the imposition of ashes for those who wish to receive ashes on their hands or foreheads. And then between 12 and 1 p.m., anyone who didn't attend the service but still wishes to receive the imposition of ashes can drive up to the church using the roundabout at the Sunday church door, and there ashes can be given directly on your forehead or hand or passed to you on a card. And so we will begin together our season of Lent by embracing our humanity and our relationship with God. And on Monday, March 6th, we will have both in-person and virtual Sunday services. In-person services will not require reservations as we do not have any capacity limits. However, we are leaving the sanctuary set up to make social distancing easy and convenient. All who attend must consider a list of questions before entering and can join us only if it is safe. In accordance with Ontario regulations, masks will be worn by all attendees, although we are able to allow for gentle singing as long as the mask remains in place. At this time, we are requiring proof of vaccination. We recognize that this is not a requirement of the provincial government, but we have a great many folk who are vulnerable and we wish to provide a safe environment for our friends to attend worship with reasonable confidence. We have a list of those who have attended previously and shown us proof of vaccination, so once you're on that list, we needn't bother you for any documentation. As conditions change, we will modify our practices, but we will always remain cautious, respectful, and hopeful. And even though we are singing, we are not offering coffee just yet, but if things keep going as we hope, that may not be too far off. So we're looking forward to being together in person, but that's not gonna change our commitment to Sunday virtual services and the holy and fulfilling relationships that we continue to develop and nurture through our virtual programs. Oh, and because coffee will come back one of these days, Jubilee is looking for a new coffee team coordinator, helping to recruit and organize the volunteers who make coffee time so important to Jubilee. The great news is that you don't have to start right away. We're not having coffee just yet. Even better, you can reimagine or reshape the way the job is done because we don't remember how to do it. <laughs> and if you want to do it the old way, actually we do have instructions, so there is kind of a map. If you're interested in what might be one of Jubilee's most cherished ministries, the Ministry of Coffee and Cookies, please be in touch with Elizabeth Clark or reach out to me and I'll put you in touch. You can always get me at nclie at jubileeunited.ca. We will soon be addressing our programs for children and youth, so please stay tuned. And to get you used to being back at church, starting this week, on Wednesdays, you're invited to drop by between 2 and 3.30 p.m. for a chat. We're going to set up tables and chairs in the foyer and garden room for people to drop by and say hello. We would ask you to please come through the Sunday church door where the roundabout is. And we will be masked and we will require that you are on our vaccine proof list. But otherwise, it's just like the old days and we will all start to get used to being together again. 
And during this time, the sanctuary will be open for prayer. So if you want to drop by and have some private time in prayer at Jubilee, now's your opportunity. So chat in the foyer, pray in the sanctuary, and I, Reverend Seelai, will be around doing whatever I can to facilitate both. It's a gentle beginning, and you are invited when you feel safe and ready. Haley Brown will be meeting virtually with children and parents today at 2 p.m. The Zoom link is on the website. And of course, you probably already know about Bible study in person on Tuesdays at 8.30 a.m. and virtually on Tuesdays at 2 p.m. Also, virtual check-ins on Tuesday at 1 p.m. and Wednesdays at 6 p.m. The links are all on the Jubilee website. Oh, and I almost forgot. This Tuesday is Pancake Tuesday, and Brienne has created this wonderful virtual event at which I only have to make pancakes and talk. I can do that. Oh, and I get to eat pancakes too. I can do that. We're kind of hoping that you might make and eat pancakes as you watch us. I mean, it won't be quite the same as getting together, but, but it could be just as messy. There will be music and, and the chance for us to chat with each other by text. And we're going to want to know what you're putting in your pancakes and, and how you like to eat them. Also, maybe a little bit about what you're planning to do for Lent this year. How do you plan to experience this holy time? It all takes place on Tuesday at 6 p.m. It's going to run for about an hour, broadcast live with some recorded bits on YouTube. The link is on the Jubilee website. Jubilee has started a new monthly fundraising venture to begin in April. We will hold a market for direct sellers, people who do not have a storefront for goods and services they have to offer. We're looking for Jubilee folk to help in a number of different ways. Your involvement could be once in a while or every month, depending on your availability. It is a pretty exciting initiative, and if you're interested and would like to be involved, please contact Pat Lanchi at pjlanchi at gmail.com. Also, be in touch if you know of a vendor who might welcome the opportunity. Jubilee's annual meeting will be held today at 1 p.m. It will be a virtual meeting done on Zoom. So please plan to join us so that we can look back at 2021 and get a look at the aspirations, the challenge, and the ministry of Jubilee in 2022. A year that promises to be a year like no other. The Zoom link is on the Jubilee website. The annual report is also available on the website. And we hope to see you at 1 p.m. And as always, I am looking for good news to include our services. We can never have enough good news, so send me your pictures, your videos, your stories of good news that we can share with others. I know the good news of the gospel, and we share that every Sunday, but we'd also like to share a little bit of your good news too. So please send it all to me at nclight at jubileeunited.ca. And as I always say, of course, I'm glad to receive pictures of life, your life, the world around you, and limericks. Perfect, flawed, funny, and odd. We want to read your limericks. You know where to send them. NCLI at jubileeunited.ca. Oh, and another thing you should know is that Park Woods United Church is hosting COVID-19 vaccine clinics on Wednesdays. I'm talking about every Wednesday from 4.30 to 7.30 p.m. First and second doses for ages five and up first, second, third for 18 and up, also third doses for ages 12 to 17. We are very happy to send you the poster by email if you want the details and contact numbers. This is a barrier-free clinic, so all you need is something with your name on it so they can verify the proper spelling of your name. International ID is accepted. Appointments and walk-ins are welcome. And finally, thank you for all of your support your first-time support, your ongoing support, your, your time, your wisdom, your experience, your money, your patience, your love. All of these things help shape our community and make it possible for us to respond to God's call to love our neighbors. We don't take any of it for granted. Folks who donate regularly or just once in a while inspire and equip us to be faithful followers of Jesus. Donations can be made through pre-authorized remittance, we call it PAR, 
e-transfer, Canada Helps, or delivered directly to the church. All of these things are an investment in a ministry that promises to be here for years to come. Legacy gifts given by current members or included in wills and final wishes help to assure us that Jubilee will be here for our grandchildren and even great-grandchildren, offering an open and inclusive faith community that shares and engages God's love. A community that offers real hope and connection whenever folks are ready. So thank you so much for your wonderful ministry and your investment in Jubilee of the present and Jubilee of the future. God bless you. On the Sunday of our annual meeting, we take some time to think of our friends who have died in the previous year. Some known to all, others known to a few, they fill our hearts. 2021 was a year in which dear friends, trusted wisdom, great compassion, and dynamic faith were celebrated in the lives of those we grieved. And so we consider in gratitude the names and faces of those upon whom our community has been built. Those whose love and legacy live on in our stories, in our church, in our hearts, and in our love. The light of Christ shone through these dear friends in life, and the light of Christ continues to shine in their legacies. Consider the light of Christ in Nancy Rowe. Ed Rutherford. Barbara Gregg. Eileen Sutherland. Joan Kennedy. Nick Stan, John Cool, Bill Seymour, Dorothy Templeton, Marilyn Conker, Gloria Gatesville. Ruth Ann Palmer and Sam Walker. Thank you, God, that these lives are part of our lives, then, now, and forever. We are together the light of Christ. A reading from Exodus 34, chapters 29 to 35. Moses came down from Mount Sinai. As he came down from the mountain with the two tablets of the covenant in his hand, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking to God. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, the skin of his face was shining, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation 
returned to him, and Moses spoke with them. Afterward, all the Israelites came near, and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, the Israelites would see the face of Moses, that the skin of his face was shining. And Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him. Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and in those days told no one any of the things they had seen. Let us pray. Loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts, broken hearts, wounded hearts, happy hearts, bursting hearts, may the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your eyes. And God, may I never lightly presume to preach your word and may we never lightly presume to hear your word, for in your word is abundant life. Amen. So Jesus and Peter, James and John, they left the others and they, they climbed a high mountain. It, it was not an easy climb. It was long, it was difficult. But they did it because Jesus asked them to. They wanted to follow Jesus. Yeah, it, it, it was hard, and it sure was difficult to understand why they had to climb a mountain to nowhere. But it was Jesus asking, after all. So they got to the top, and Luke's gospel wastes no time. Without any preamble, it says, and while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Say, what now? Huh? 
a long, hard journey up a mountain to say some prayers, and suddenly Jesus' clothes change from the dusty, climb-worn brown to dazzling white. But it doesn't stop there. The gospel continues. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking to Jesus. Elijah and Moses. Oh, man. Seriously, consider, consider the power of that vision. It's especially to a first century Jew, okay? I mean, pick your, your, your two biggest heroes, Gandhi and Martin Luther King, um, Terry Fox and Tommy Douglas, uh, Louis Armstrong and Duke Ellington, whatever. These, these weren't even men to the observers. These, I mean, they'd been dead for so long. Th these were legends, absolute legends. This was, this was bigger than anything they'd ever experienced. The prophet, Elijah, and the lawgiver, Moses. They didn't even use the names very often. They just called them the prophet and the lawgiver, and everybody knew who you were talking about. And there they were talking to Jesus. <laughs> Peter, he didn't know what to do. I mean, everything that he believed, everything he wanted to believe, was verifiably, right before his very eyes, true. Oh, you get it? Jesus was, was connected to Elijah and Moses. Jesus was divine. There could be no doubt. Jesus, Jesus was going to make a difference. This wasn't just, well, maybe if people listen. No, he knew in that moment, Jesus is, is of God. Jesus is going to make a difference. I, in his heart, he always knew. I got it. But now Peter really knew. The excitement, the awe, the wonder, the, the joy of it all. Peter was uh, awestruck. And I know for a whole lot of people, the story is just kind of weird. A little bit magical, a little bit, hmm. But for me, seriously, it's the story. I mean, this is the story. I, I love Christmas, absolutely. Easter is really great, but this is the story. The one, the one that rises above them all. I mean, not to be overly dramatic, because you know I would never, ever want to be overly dramatic. But I have come to realize that everything I ever needed to know I learned from Transfiguration. Not to be dramatic. Everything I've ever needed to know, I've learned from the Transfiguration. <laughs> Remarkable, isn't it? And I'm going to share it with you today. So aren't you glad, you know, that you followed the link? <laughs> okay, so the first thing that I've learned is that sometimes you have to go to God. Not because God is distant, but because sometimes you have to make the effort. I mean, we talk a lot about God being present all around us and how God searches us out. Especially in the last couple of years of isolation, we've relied on that. But sometimes, sometimes we have to make the effort as well. We have to climb a mountain or two so that we can approach God. People will say like, oh, I don't... I just don't get this God thing, you know? I don't feel God's presence. I mean, I wish I could. I'm just not getting it. Okay? How hard are you trying? I mean, really. How hard are you trying? Do you, do you set aside some time every day? Are, are you praying? Often? Every day? Twice a day? Three times a day? Are you? Are you sharing your thoughts, your questions, and your experiences or are you keeping all that to yourself? This whole thing is very private. Are you trying to understand God's will for you in any given situation? Or do you just sort of leave that for, you know, church times? I don't worry about it when I'm in the kitchen cooking. I don't think about it when I'm on a walk. I don't think about it when I'm goofing around with my friends. Ah, it's a church thing. <laughs> do you watch the whole church service? You know, the one that you're linked into right now? Do you watch even the parts that, that bug you? Do you make an effort to find the meaning in the stuff that you're not accustomed to? The things that might make you feel uncomfortable? 
Do you try? Do you climb any kind of mountains? Are you open to what God might be saying to you, even if it's not what you want to hear? Are you really listening for God to do something other than affirm that everything you believe is right? Do you come to God for confirmation, or do you come to God for challenge? Now, I'm not criticizing anybody, okay? I'm really not. But if you want to feel the presence of God in your life, I mean, if my experience is anything to go by, I mean, if you want to feel it, really feel it, sometimes it takes an effort. Like going up a mountain. Or volunteering to do something new. Helping someone in need. Risking ridicule for not making decisions based on some kind of social or economic expediency, but just going with your faith, with your heart. Sometimes you have to change your mind. How hard are you really trying? And some of you right now are probably nodding. Yeah. And some of you are afraid to nod. Even though you're at home where nobody else can see you, Because we acknowledge it is a mountain to climb some days. Oh, and it is hard, and we don't like things that are hard. I don't like things that are hard. But you know what? You'd be surprised how often mountains shrink when you start making the effort. (laughs) I learned that from the Transfiguration. Second thing that I learned is that sometimes... You really do have to get away. I mean, you might notice that Jesus led Peter and James and John away. Away from the crowds, away from the regulations and restrictions of gathering in public or being in a group. Away from rent and groceries. Away from conflicts and rivalries. Away from worries. Just away. Sometimes you just have to let go of things. I mean, that is if you want to feel the presence of God. And I mean really, really feel it. Sometimes you have to stop worrying about what's going on at work or where your neighbor's parking his car or what your in-laws are saying about you or, or even how you're going to pay the bills next month. Sometimes you just have to let that go. Take yourself away from those things. Just breathe and be and listen for the quiet voice of God. Yoga works for a whole bunch of folk. Quiet meditation works. You might be able to hear that voice of God, that quiet voice of God when you're out in the forest, or, you know, that's, yeah, as the ground crackles and the trees groan, yeah, that works. Sometimes you can just feel it deep inside your chest if you sit quietly. Not calling it meditation, heaven forbid, but just sitting there quietly. Listen for it. Just hush the world around you and hear that voice whisper, you are my child and I love you. (sighs) For me, if I can't get it in the forest, um, I can actually sit in my office at home and I can spin vinyl records. Little Joe Cocker always helps. Love lifts us up where we belong, where the eagles cry on a mountain high. Love lifts us up where we belong, far from the world below, where the clear winds blow. <laughs> And you know what? Like for the Transfiguration, oh, for the Transfiguration, it's all, it's all Kenny Loggins singing for the first time. I don't know if you remember it. Look it up. It's such a, for the first time, I'm looking in your eyes. For the first time, seeing who you are. <laughs> One of these days, I'm going to have to try and talk Brienne into singing that for a Transfiguration service, because that's the one that really captures what was going on for Peter. (laughs) 
You see, thinking about that, all that old music, some people like me, we've just let go of everything, haven't we? See, it, it, it works. Sometimes you just have to get away. It doesn't matter how you get away, it, it, but getting away has to matter, if you follow me. <laughs> it, it, it has to matter. Like, if you get away, but then stay the same when you come back, what's the point? I mean, if a spiritual experience doesn't change you somehow, is it really a spiritual experience? If you engage in a digital worship service like, like, like this one, and I'm glad you're here, thank you, but if you engage in this service and it doesn't affect your life, is it really a spiritual experience or is it just another kind of Netflix, right? I mean, I'm not saying you have to radically reorient your life every time you engage in a worship service or a spiritual experience or a, a meditation group or, 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 or a book group. It doesn't have to just change everything. But if your thoughts and ideas and actions never change, what's the point? And I have to wonder, in the story we hear that Jesus changed, that's the whole point, right? Transfiguration Sunday. It's all about how Jesus changes. But did he, did he change, do you think? I mean, it seems to me that Peter saw who Jesus is, maybe for the first time, really saw who Jesus is, the real Jesus. And it was overwhelming. It was, it was like love. It was love. But then... But then it was Peter that changed, right? Not Jesus. Do you remember how the world changed when you became a mother? You saw things differently, didn't you? Or a grandfather, a dad. Remember when you graduated, how the world just seemed transfigured? Just different. Everything was just not the same. Everybody, every one of us have had that, that moment, something in our lives, glorious or, or tragic, and after that moment, everything looks different, feels different, everything is different, but, but the world didn't really change. You changed. I changed. <laughs> so knowing that the most profound changes actually happen to me, I've also learned that if I really want to change anything in the world, I have to be prepared for change in myself. <laughs> Sometimes that is so tough. I mean, I say that I want change, right? I want things to be better. But what I really mean is that I'd like everything around me to change so that I feel better, <laughs> if I'm being honest. The world around Peter didn't change. He did. Now, please, don't, don't, don't think that what I'm saying is that if everything in your life is terrible, that it's all your fault. I, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that, well, if you just change, it'd be fine. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that if you want the world to be different, then you had better be prepared to be different as well. I guess that means that you can't stay the victim or the boss. You can't always be the child. You can't always be the winner. You can't be the perpetual loser, even if you're good at it. You have to start acting and talking and thinking and being different. <laughs> Three things that I learned from this little strange story. You have to make an effort for God you have to get away, and you have to be prepared to change. Pretty solid sermon. He always told me, you know, a joke, three things, another joke, that's got it. But, but if you've got all these things covered, now what? Right? Spiritual awakening, personal perspective changing. Now what? Well, Peter, he wants to keep it just so. 
right? He's ready to build structures for Jesus and Moses and Elijah, little booths, so they can stay right there, and then Peter can stay there, and they can all stay there, and nothing will ever have to change. They can just bask in the glow of God's presence. Oh, he's so nice. We get it, don't we? I get it. That great kiss, that perfect vacation, the relationship that completes us and makes us whole, the meal that is so good that you could eat it again and you maybe even do. That might be me. But the thing is, we can't. We know that. We can't. We know that nothing lasts forever. We have to accept change. We have to go back down the mountain. As good as that kiss was, as perfect as that relationship, as wonderful as the moment, we go back down the mountain. Back to where bills have to be paid and rivalries are renewed and conflicts arise and the mess of everyday life won't stay hidden. We have to deal with it. I learned that from the Transfiguration too. You have to go back down the mountain. I didn't like learning it. Quite often, I just want to stay on the mountain with no bills and no worries and no decisions to make and just bask in the glory of God. But I can't. I have learned that life isn't lived in any one place. Right? It's up and it's down. It's back and it's forth. It's mountain and it's valley. But the thing is, you don't have to forget what you experienced on the mountain. Peter didn't forget. Years later, he would tell his story to others. And that story becomes part of our tradition and part of our four Gospels. And as you sort through the messiness of everyday life, it's good to remember those great moments, those mountaintop experiences. When you're figuring out how much you have to pay Visa and wondering if you'll have enough to pay MasterCard, it helps to be able to just stop and remember those life-changing moments. Oh, I'm more than paying bills. I am holy and amazing. I, I have been in the presence of God. I am in the presence of God. Yeah, I have to go back down the mountain But knowing that I can go back up again, knowing that there's a mountain even, makes the valley a pretty good place too. Yeah, the transfiguration has taught me a thing or two about getting through the tough times. (laughs) And one one more thing, just one more thing. The transfiguration has also taught me something (laughs) that my father has tried to teach me for years. In the face of this incredible moment, right, Peter doesn't begin to spout grand theology or shout forth the creed. Instead, to my ears, he begins to babble. Oh, it's so good to be here. Okay, look, look, we're going to build a shelter, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Then we can all stay here, and it's going to be great, and we'll just be here all the time, and nothing will change. Everything will be great, and it'll be wonderful, and we'll just have a good time together all the time. We can have beaters and wieners and beans. We can do all the great things. I love the part of the story because it's so ordinary and so human. And I cringe for Peter. (laughs) I am embarrassed for him in his babbling. I just want to grab him and stop him from carrying on like that. And that's when I hear my father's words, clear as a bell, Norman, better to remain silent and thought a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. (laughs) Did he know that I would become a preacher? (laughs) If I could be there, I would yell, quiet, silence, Peter. Don't you know you're standing on holy ground? Shh, silence, Peter, silence. Silence is so unsettling, so unnerving, and so uncomfortable. 
isn't it, Peter? <laughs> we don't like having that much open space in our lives. So we fill our lives up with, with activity and noise and building places to contain the holy. All the while, God is bursting forth from the heavens with a word, look, this is my beloved son. He's the apple of my eye, the image of my heart. Listen to him. The transfiguration has taught me that sometimes things happen that we don't understand. And sometimes the best response is silence. Because in that silence is wonder and amazement, openness, hope, promise, God's love, and today's gospel. Thanks be to God. Are those your eyes? Is that your smile? I've been looking at you forever. But I never saw you before. Are these your hands holding mine? Now I wonder how I could have been so blind. For the first time, I am looking in your eyes. For the first time, I'm seeing who you are. I can't believe how much I see when you're looking back at me. Now I understand why love is, love is for the first time. this be real oh, can this be true am i the person i was this morning and are you the same you it's all so strange how can it be all along this love was right in front of me for the first time i am looking in your eyes for the first time i'm seeing who you are i can't believe how much i see when you're looking back at me now i understand what love is love is for the first time such a long time ago i had given up on finding this emotion ever again but you live with me now yes i found you somehow and i've never been so sure And for the first time, I am looking in your eyes. For the first time, I'm seeing who you are. I can't believe how much I see when you're looking back at me. Now I've finally found what love is. Love is for 
for the first time God of Transfiguration this may not be the first time that any of us have prayed. But loving God, may we pray with the same earnestness, the same trust, the same truth, and the same hope as when we first opened our hearts to you. May we encounter you anew. In this encounter, in this time of prayer, may we be transformed. Let us come to know how much you see when you see us. Let us understand your fierce, transformative love for all of creation. We come to the end of Black History Month. Let this not be the end. Never the end of loving and uplifting your children descended from Africa but belonging and residing throughout the world. Let us embrace the wisdom and the joy. Let us engage in the struggle and let us experience the justice that can only be heard in black voices, built by black hands and honored by all of your children. We give thanks for a time set aside for learning and celebrating and pray that we have been transformed. Seeing you, seeing Jesus, seeing all our siblings as they truly are, not as we imagine them to be. We come in prayer carrying the anger and the division that we have seen in our country in recent months. We lay it before you asking for transformation. Let us look deep within ourselves. Let us look carefully at our neighbors. Let us look lovingly at our enemies. And let us see you. If not on a mountain, then behind the eyes, on the tongues, and in the hearts of us all. Too long, God, we have been the same. We have seen the world the same way. We see ourselves the same way. We see our neighbors the same way. We have become complacent. Lovingly shake us up. Make us aware that we are on holy ground everywhere we are. We are in your presence wherever we may go. And so, God, in this knowledge, let us seize the opportunities to love, knowing that you are with us. Let us relish the opportunities to learn, knowing that you are with us. Let us move toward each other and not away, knowing that we need not be afraid. You are with us. We are not alone. Don't let us live as if we are. As we pray for Ukraine, we pray for all those at war, all of your children who are afraid, all of your beloveds who don't know what tomorrow may bring. There is war all around this planet. There is war in our families and even in our hearts. God, we pray for peace, transformative peace that invites us to see the world anew. Like Peter, we recognize in this holy moment that it is good to be here. But let us not cling to the mountain or to this moment. Let us take these moments into the world and let us be agents of change. Let us delight together in a cold, sunny day, in a break from routine, in a call from a friend, in the promise of change. Let us be grateful for our leaders who try to provide. Let us give thanks for the followers who make the leaders' aspirations reality. And let us give support 
to those who change their mind when conditions change. Remind us that we are in this together. We need each other. God, thank you for the gift of life. May we use it to make life better for each other, loving and living as Jesus lives and loves in our midst. Let us pray as he taught us to pray. And in these words, let us understand what love is. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Go forth from this moment and go out into the world, whether you are climbing the mountain or coming back down from the mountain. Know that you travel with God. Know that God is all around you. God, the creator, is with you. Know that Jesus walks with you, transfigured even as you change. And know that the Holy Spirit absolutely surrounds and fills each and every one of us. Until we gather again, amen. <laughs>